Uh, the following is a recreation of a presentation made on August 10th, 2016 at a special meeting organized by the Negril Chamber of Commerce in Negril, Jamaica, entitled Building with Nature, Environmentally Sound Solutions to Beach Erosion. And what I'm going to be showing is my presentation at that meeting, along with some additional information that's uh, additional that was to what was presented. <clears throat> and this is a map of the places I dived around the grill to look at the conditions of the reefs just before the workshop. Uh, these are areas that I had known extremely well for 60 years, but had not dived in for 20 years. So, um, but I will, I, in this particular talk, I'm going to conf uh, focus entirely on what it is we have done using biorock technology to grow back beaches, coral reefs, sea grasses, and restore environments. And so I will not be talking further about applications in the grill. I'll be showing what we've done elsewhere. I will mention only very briefly some of the long-term changes that have happened in the grill. <clears throat> um, so to begin with, um, it was a real pleasure to be back in the grill because I have known the beach for 60 years. I first knew the beach back when it was not a single building the entire length of the beach. It was entirely planted in tall Jamaica coconuts, all of which died out in the early 60s from disease, the lethal yellowing disease. And so at that point, there was no road between Negril and Orange Bay. And you could only get to Negril Beach by going by boat around. And at that point, 60 years ago, my father was diving on the coral reefs in Negril in order to develop an environmental management plan to protect the coral reefs in the grill that was submitted to the Town Planning Authority of Jamaica and to Premier Norman Manley in 1960 prior to any development of the grill, before there was a road, before there was a single building on the beach. At that point, the reefs were alive, and the beach was a lot wider than it is now. <clears throat> when development came in, and the road came in, one of the things that happened is the sewage from the hotels and the people who moved into the area all went into the sea and it resulted in green water the whole length of Long Bay. And what that did is the excess nutrients coming from sewage caused weedy algae to, to grow like mad and those overgrew and killed the good sand producing algae that were growing in the seagrass beds and in the reef all in front. That was a natural sand factory that made Negril Beach. But because of pollution, the supply of sand was basically killed off. The good algae that produced the sand were overgrown by bad algae that didn't produce it. And the water was very green. And that, again, in addition, the corals in shallow water died. They were damaged by hurricanes, but they were also damaged by systematic policies in, with the early hotels of reef walking. They'd take tourists out to walk on top of the corals, advising them to wear heavy shoes so they didn't harm their feet. And a large part of the shallow coral reefs that had protected the beach died off as a result. And then what happened because of the increasing pollution is the algae simply overgrew and smothered and killed the reef. I was asked to come in to help Negril in about 1990 to help the dive shops explain why algae was suddenly overgrowing their reef. And we had seen it happening from long before. We had in fact seen a long-term decline of coral growth in Negril going back to the 1940s, accelerating after development went in around 1970s or so with the fastest growing corals slowing down the most. And, and back in the 80s, I began to see large amounts of algae beginning right near the South Negril River at the south end piling up. This spread until most of the reef was swallowed up by algae. And this happened later in Negril, only in the 1990s that that happened. But it had happened earlier all in, the, in all of the other parts of Jamaica. And Negril was the last part of Jamaica to be affected. And that has affected the beach. But the good thing about Negril Beach is that this is the, not only the largest beach in Jamaica, it is the best protected beach in Jamaica. It has the least erosion of any beach in Jamaica. So we lost quite a bit of sand following development. But in fact, for the last 20 years, it's has stabilized, surprisingly. And that's sort of an accident, a short-term accident due to the fact that we've had a lucky few years without any hurricanes. And in this period of time, the beach is built up. There's 50 feet of new sand, most of the length of the beach now, that was not there 20 years ago when I was last here. So the erosion has been minimal compared to other places in Jamaica. It has been greatest at the north end because every time there's a norther, 
the, the sand gets washed to the south. And so it loses their sand in every north. And that has always been the case here. But it has been made worse by a very persistent pollution problem right at the north end of the beach that you can see in terms of large masses of slimy green algae. They are preventing regrowth of the sand, producing algae and, and producing bad smells. So it's over badly polluted here. <clears throat> now, one result of putting in the sewage treatment plant was that all the sewage that used to come out into the bay and was damaging the, algae, the sand production here now goes into the sewer system and gets dumped into the morass into the South Negril River. So all the nutrients that were coming into the beach now have been displaced. And that has allowed the northern and, and central parts of the reef to stabilize. Only about 5 or 10 percent live coral left in most of it. But the situation is relatively stabilized. The green water has largely gone away in most of the northern and central part of the bay. But that is because the sewage system was never designed to remove the nutrients that were causing the algae overgrowth. And so those now are concentrated here into the South Negril River. And they affect the areas down here at the south end of the bay. So those, in a sense, these areas have been stabilized at, at the cost of these areas here. In addition, what I'm seeing is that these reefs in the north, which used to be the best reefs in the region, have been completely overgrown by algae. And that seems to be coming from up current along the shore from the Green Island and Lucy direction. That's out of control. These reefs are essentially done. <clears throat> Some of these are recovering. And I did not have time to dive here in the south, which are the really critical areas. But in, in general, the reefs have stabilized at a low level. And they're starting to recover. But without regrowing the branching corals, we will not have protection for the shoreline. Without reducing the nutrients, we're not going to have the sand production we need to grow the beach back naturally. So it's been a fairly stable situation, but that's only a temporary situation, as I will show you. So I want to discuss here what we have done in other places that could be used to grow and grill beaches, coral reefs, and fisheries back naturally. So. The choices in the grill are several. One is to do nothing at all, to pretend it isn't happening. Stick your head in the sand, pretend nothing is happening. And it looks like that at the moment, because we've had a lucky few years in which the beach has grown. But in fact, this is the fool's paradise solution. It is running away from the problem. Global sea level rise is three to four millimeters a year. It is going to accelerate a great deal. So to do nothing is going to mean ultimately to lose the beach, even though you don't really have a critical problem right now. Second option is to do what a lot of beach experts all around the world are now rec recommending, which is simply to abandon the coastline, run away to the hills, abandon it now, and minimize your losses because sea level rise is going to come. And that's OK if you don't have a large investment in existing infrastructure. And I don't think that's what you want to do here. The third option is hard engineering. And that's the option that has always been presented here in Negril. It was just rejected by, by the government, by the Planning Institute of Jamaica a couple weeks ago, which was to build a seawall, a rock concrete wall in front of the beach. I want to say just a few things about the hard engineering solution. Seawalls and breakwaters work to protect what is behind them as long as they remain standing up. But every single seawall that has ever been built has fallen down or will fall down for a very fundamental reason of physics. Because seawalls are designed to reflect the waves. They bounce off. All the energy out of the wave gets concentrated right at the plane of that wall. And the result of that is that all the sand in front of the wall is going to be washed away. And when that's gone, the sand that's under the structure is going to be washed away. It's going to be, and then the whole structure will settle, crumble, crack, and fall apart. It needs to be rebuilt. And that's an inevitable result of the physics of what happens with seawalls. And you can see for yourself anywhere here in Negril or in Jamaica, if you dive along the rocky shores or rocky shores anywhere in the world, there is no sand to about 15 feet or more below the surface because the waves reflecting off the rocks wash all sand away. And that's what a seawall does. So we know what that will do. So it's, it's, and it's an extremely expensive option. It costs about 10 to 15 million US dollars per kilometer. It's guaranteed not to work in the long run. And it's an extremely expensive solution. And the third solution is the one that I'm going to be talking about here, which is restoring the natural processes that grow coral reefs and beaches and seagrass and marine ecosystems that created the natural beach in the first place. 
And I'm going to show you how we have done that in many places throughout the world and could do it here in Negril. <clears throat> this is what our reefs used to look like when I was a boy. In fact, this is after they were severely damaged by Hurricane Charlie in 1951, which did a lot of damage all around Jamaica. <clears throat> we didn't have many hurricanes for many years until Allen and, and then Gilbert. <clears throat> and all of this has disappeared. We, these corals have vanished. These were the shallow corals that were in a wall all around Jamaica except for the river mouths. And that protected the beach and allowed the sand to accumulate. <clears throat> Those are gone. We have now is only a little understory, the last few percent of survivors. <clears throat> and if we don't bring that back, we're not going to be able to protect the beach or something like that. A coral reef acts in a completely different way than a seawall. The waves go through the coral reef. It's full of cracks and crevices and channels and passages. So the waves are not reflected at all. There's no reflection. It passes through the structure and dissipates energy. And when it reaches the shore, it deposits sand instead of washing it away. And what we do is we grow reef-like structures that function the way natural coral reefs do to grow beaches without reflecting waves and causing erosion. And that's what I will show you now. <coughs> We call it BioRock technology. It's really a revolutionary technology because, among other things, we greatly speed up the growth of corals in all living organisms. And I will show you examples of that. As a result, we're able to keep coral reefs alive where they would die, and we can restore them and grow them back in a few years in places where there's no natural recovery and create superior habitat for marine organisms. As a result, we have the best and most cost-effective solution for restoring damaged and polluted ecosystems and fisheries for new ways of mariculture for shore protection from rising sea level, ecotourism, and many other marine problems. Biorock technology was originally invented by an architect named Wolf Hilbert in order to grow building materials in the sea that he could produce of any size or shape by growing limestone, solid rock, the rock that makes up most of Jamaica and makes up coral reefs using very low trickle charges of electricity. He invented this method to produce building materials from the sea 40 years ago. 30 years ago, I heard about his work and I invited him to come here to Jamaica to work with me to apply it towards coral reef restoration. And so all what follows, the technology for environmental restoration that I will show you was first invented and developed here in Jamaica in the 1980s. And for the first 10 years, we worked exclusively in Jamaica. At that point, we were forced to give up our work due to lack of funding, and I had to go abroad. And uh, since then, we did, the technology has not been used in Jamaica for 20 years, but we have used it in more than 400 projects in more than 40 countries all around the world, all across the Caribbean, <coughs> Indian Ocean, Pacific, Southeast Asia, Mediterranean, and the Atlantic. I'll show you only a few examples of those that are particularly relevant here. Well, these are some of the first projects we made in St. Anne's on the north coast of Jamaica, and we were growing corals in an area where the reef had been completely smothered by algae because of sewage pollution and overgrown. We took a few small fragments of corals and we were growing them there in a, in a reef that was dying. We were growing the corals at record rates and producing in the frontier large amounts of sand producing algae. We're actually growing sand on our structures as well as growing corals many times faster than normal in very polluted waters. <coughs> This was here in Negril in 1992. These are staghorn corals, which are the dominant corals in much of Jamaican reefs that have almost disappeared. I've only seen half a dozen small colonies here in Negril diving all week, and all of them have had disease. We were growing them here in Negril at record rates, nearly a centimeter a week. We were also growing elkhorn coral here in Negril back then, and this is essentially vanished. I've seen one small one the whole time I've been diving here this week. This was the most important coral. This is the one that spread out in force in the shallowest water and protected the beaches. This is the one, one of the ones we need to go back, and we were able to do so here at Negril. Well, when we stopped working in Jamaica, we started working in many other places, building structures all over the place. This is an example from Indonesia. This is a four-year-old bio-rock reef. It's an area where the reefs had died for many different reasons, and uh, we grew it back. It's on barren sand. We're growing corals at record rates. We have huge schools of fish. We've restored the entire fisheries of a village that had collapsed by building up huge fish populations. In this case, we have more than 100 structures in front of this village 
using as much electricity as one air conditioner. It's another example of a four-year-old reef. You can build them in any size or shape. There are no limitations at all. And the size or shape we build depends on a lot of very specific factors. Different organisms, different fish like different shapes, octopus, lobster, corals, oysters, so forth. We grow them all. When we began at this location in Indonesia, the reef was essentially dead. You can see there was almost no live coral here. We're laying the cables down. Everything is dead and covered with mud. This is the same area 10 years later, essentially completely covered with live coral. So that, that's what we do. So the reason we were able to do this is because our process greatly speeds the settlement, the growth, the survival, and the resistance to environmental stresses like high temperatures, high mud, or high pollution of, of all marine organisms. It doesn't help against diseases, but basically everything else. And so the result is when we have high temperature bleaching, we had in the Maldives, 1,600 to 5,000% higher survival of corals. And the whole reefs died from bleaching. The ones we were growing remained alive. They're just much stronger. And it's due to the electrical field. We're creating the ideal biophysical conditions that all forms of life use to make their own biological energy. So we're stimulating them very gently to grow faster and healthier and resist damage. So we get much greater settlement, much greater faster growth, um, much higher survival from stress, and we're creating biological energy. So in addition to the biological benefits, we are growing solid structures in the sea that are getting stronger with age. This is completely unique. Every other marine construction material is strongest when you build it and begins to rust, corrode, crumble, crack, and fall apart from the first day, and they lose strength. Our structures are growing. They're growing solid limestone rock. We grow it at about one to two centimeters a year, and the rock we produce can be more than three times harder than ordinary concrete. So it's, it's a growing structure that's getting stronger with age. The steel that we grow the limestone over never rusts, as other steel will. And moreover, it repairs itself if it's damaged. So that's a really unique feature. So we're growing limestone out of the ocean where it wouldn't normally happen. These are examples of the rock we've grown. These are about two years of growth around steel bars. And this is a solid material. This is how it self-repairs. In this case, a boat broke loose from a mooring and smashed into a structure in Indonesia. This is the steel bar that had been in the water for 12 years, and there's not a bit of rust on it. It'd been in the sea. It shows the reef that the boat hit into. And then a year later, the limestone grew back over the damaged areas and it healed itself. So this is, this is a unique sort of shore protection device that uh, if it's damaged in a hurricane, it will grow back in the damaged areas as long as you keep the current on. Naturally, everyone asks, what about hurricanes? This is a huge bio rock reef. Well, not that huge. Here's a person in front of the governor's house in Grand Turk in the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's only about 20 feet of water. We put thousands of corals that we rescued that were being damaged by the cruise ship port, by water stirred up by the propellers and by dredging. We rescued those corals and put, put them on. And these photographs were taken before and after the two worst hurricanes in the history of the Turks and Caicos Islands that hit three days apart, one right after the other, that damaged or destroyed 80% of all the buildings on the island the worst they'd ever had in their history. And um, our cable that was providing the power from the shore got, got shredded. But you can see there was no damage to the structure, not even to the corals. And that's because the waves passed right through it. In fact, it built up sand. The sand piled up around the bottom and buried the bottom in it, whereas solid structures like these concrete blocks here in the center, half of those got ripped apart and thrown away. Solid objects would have been a solid breakwater would have been ripped apart by this kind of storm. And uh, concrete structures would have been buried in the sand, but ours built up sand instead. This structure was not even welded. We did not have a welding machine or electricity when we built it on the beach. It was entirely hand tied together with wires. And so that's why I say we're, we're quite confident these structures can survive hurricanes because the physics is completely different than a seawall. They don't reflect waves. Okay, here's an example of growing a beach. This is in the Maldives. 
It's a tourist economy. Every single island has a severe erosion problem. Most of them are surrounded by rock walls because their beaches have gone. And here's a typical example. There's a cliff in the sea. The trees and buildings are falling into the sea. They're desperately piling up sandbags. In front of this reef, eroding beach, we built a bio-rock reef in shallow water right on the bare rock in front of it. There was no sand there when we built it. We grew corals on top of that. And in about two years, we grew back the beach. In less than two years, we grew back a 50-foot wide beach or 15-meter wide beach. When we began, this building was about to fall into the sea and the management of the hotel said there was no way that they could save it. They were going to have to tear it down. Well, we grew the beach right back by growing the reef in front and very quickly. And this here you can see the bio rock reef is a dark line right in front of the beach. That's a new beach. It completely disappeared. The building we saved and the first picture was taken here. And this reef here, our coral survived high temperature bleaching in 1998, whereas an actual reef, all the corals died. 99% of them died from high temperatures. The fish moved out of the dead reef into our structure, so we had the only place in the Maldives was a live reef full of fish right in front of a, a natural beach. It was the only place that they had that. So that grew very quickly. Here is our reef. This is now in 2010. We built this in 1997. This is 13 years later. And you can see our reef is healthy and built up sand. This sand wasn't there. It was, it, the sand had been washed away. It was hard rock and rubble. And that's the beach we grew, and it's stayed stable for more than 15 years. The Asian tsunami passed right over it. Here's another example in Indonesia. Here's a site where they're piling up concrete bags cement bags here on the shore, the trees are falling to the sea, the sand's washing away, uh, the buildings are, are about to collapse, and they're, they're desperate here at this point. This is a much more severe erosion site than Jamaica, more exposed, much larger tides and waves. We built bio rock structures there. These are shown at low tide, so exposed at low tide, and they're on, underwater at high tide. You can see the beach, there's no sand on the hard ground here. We built these offshore. It's not what we do here in Negril. We'd build ones that were below the, the um, low tide mark so you wouldn't see them. But in this case, we needed the protection right away. And within eight months on Google Earth, you could see we built the structures. The areas that were eroding are now starting to grow in the beach. And you can see that actually on satellite images um, from Google Earth within eight months. Another site in Indonesia, we built bio rock structures in front. This hotel here had a severe erosion problem. They'd built a wall to keep their patio from falling into the sea. And that wall, when we began, was completely undermined and about to collapse. We put the bio rock structures in. A year later, the sand had piled up in front of it. But when we began, it actually had been excavated under and was on the point of collapse in large parts of it. So we grew back the beach there within one year. If you now turn around and look behind you, that's the next door property. <clears throat> that's where the road used to be there. And if we now look beyond that fallen tree at that neighbor, that's their seawall that was built at the same time as the seawall we grew the beach back in front of one year before. So this shows you what happens. I mean, these people have a real erosion problem, and we're able to help them quickly. <clears throat> Here's another example in Indonesia of a very different location. As you can see, there's a big erosion scarp there. Um, the whole beach is washed away. It's steadily retreating inland. They've got uh, beach cottages that are about to fall into the sea. Uh, here, these are actually the foundations of a cottage that they had to move because it was about to collapse into the ocean. It had been built quite a bit inland. So, you know, these people really have an erosion problem. And um, we'd be, in December, we started building bio rock offshore structures to protect this beach. And we installed them. Uh, this is, you know, in June and December, there was no ch really no change. This tree was collapsing into the sea. And then this is just before we began building them. And we installed bio rock reef protection structures in, a, in this area. This is the area of worst erosion, a few here. Um, and, but this is the main area. We have about 50 bio rock shore protection structures there. And um, this is how it looked last week. 80, in fact, 80% of the beach grew back within about two months. By about April, it had grown back. And so that was that structure that was about to fall into the sea. The sand is built up in front of it. That was that tree that was like, half exposed. The sand's built up right around it. And when you look offshore, those are the bio rock reefs protecting them. 
So this is, I mean, here, here you're, you're seeing it at low tide, so you can see them, but in Negro we'd put them so you wouldn't see them. You know, we'd do that, something like that, in front of the sea lane. This is how they look underwater in this particular case, and here they're, you know, they're steel, it's not rusting at all, growing nicely, and the seagrass, as you can see, is growing very lush and rich around it, and digging up the seagrass has been one cause of the erosion of the beaches in Negril. People foolishly dug it up, not realizing it was what held the sand in place. So we grow back the seagrass with bio rock as well and salt marsh. And as you can see here, again, this picture taken last week, we have baby corals springing up all around the base. These little things here are all small corals. Okay, so uh, we're bringing that area back, and of course, the fish are coming back as well. So this is a hypothetical example of a design we could do for a certain unnamed property at the north end of Negril Beach. And they've twice asked for my help to design a bio rock reef to grow back their beach after northerners have eroded it away. And every time we prepared proposals for them, they then decided what they really wanted was a rock wall. Uh, I think it's important to understand that a rock wall that would, in front of a beach like this, for about that cost, we could grow back the reef and the beach the entire length of the beach, not just this little portion of the north end. So what we do costs a fraction of the amount of what a, a rock or seawall costs. <clears throat> this is another design here, again for Negril. This is for West Ender, which used to be called Hog Heaven, which is down on the, on the West End. And they have a little rocky cove with no beach because it's too rough. It's a very rough entry. I know the area because I used to dive from there all the while. And what we want to do is basically build a reef in front and allow a small beach to accumulate there so people can safely get in and out of the water. We've had that proposal. We submitted that last year to the National Environmental Planning Agency for approval, and we are still waiting to hear. These are examples sort of shore protection modules. But my point is, is that we can do this easily, any place. In fact, Negro would be one of the easiest places to grow the beach back because we have the sand production there. All we need to do is protect it so it doesn't get washed away at the shore and start growing back the corals. Negro would be the easiest place in the world for us to grow back a beach and reef because it's so protected. How you part is a very site-specific decision. This is here in Jamaica too. This is near Montego Bay, again, 25 years ago when we were building solar panels in the sea. It's because what we could do here, besides building shore protection reefs to grow the beach back is we can restore the outer reefs out by Sandy Key and out by Middle Shoals, the reefs that have been trampled to death by tourism. We could, if we grow back the reefs around those areas using solar panels, we will then have the outer barrier of living corals protecting the beach even more. So this is an option that is easily done here, and again, solar panels are one way to do it. We also do work with wave energy generators. Unfortunately, that won't work here in Negril. We have the least waves of any place in the Caribbean, so it's the most protected shorelands anywhere. Um, so anyway, that's, that's something that's potential, and uh, we could make a lot of energy in other places around Jamaica with wave power, shore protection structures, but not in Negril and Fortis. We'd have to either power it from shore, or we'd have to power it with solar panels, but that can be done. <coughs> Now I'm going to show you another key aspect of what we do with Biorock, and that's to restore fisheries habitat. The fisheries here at Negril is in desperate condition, and um, I'm going to show you a project we did two months ago in Vanuatu in the South Pacific, because we work with communities to restore their coral reefs and fisheries. This is a fishing community in Vanuatu. They lost their coral reef in 1943. It was dredged up in order to build a U.S. naval base in the Second World War. And so they don't have a reef, and they want their reef back. So here we are, we're building very simple modules, training the local fishermen how to install them, working with the school children. This is a day they will never forget when they start to grow back the future, you know, future food for their, their whole community. They'll never forget this. They love it. And working with the fishermen to grow back their reefs and building modules. And again, this is something we need to do here in Negril as well, is to restore the fisheries, for example, in Little Bay. Now, what I'm showing you here, that what we've done is only a short and medium term solution. We can grow the corals back, we can grow the beaches, we can grow the seagrass back. But at the same time, we have a very serious long term issue with nutrients in Negril. There's too much because a sewage treatment plant was never designed to remove the nutrients. It could easily be 
retrofitted in order to absorb the nutrients and prevent them getting into the ocean and get rid of the algae problem and allow the reef to recover naturally. And in fact, we had proposed that in the Negril Area Environmental Management Plan that I was the lead author of that was accepted by the government in 1995 but was never implemented. It would not be hard to retrofit the sewage plant to prevent the nutrients from going in. And it's crucial to do so because the massive building of new huge hotels at the north end of the beach is going to now put much more sewage into the system, which is at this point not able to remove any nutrients at all and is causing problems. So we need to do that. So there are long-term issues. Again, I'm not here to discuss that now, but it, if you clean up the nutrients, it does work. And I did that in Dragon Bay in Portland. In addition, in the long run, we have to face the fact that climate change is real. And it's important to understand that we need to reduce the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the sea level here in Jamaica from 120,000 years ago, the last time when global temperatures were one or two degrees higher than today. It's, it's seven meters above today's sea level. You can see it on the south side of Negril Hill in a few places. This is on the north coast. And the point is here, at that time, the CO2 was about 40% less than it is now. The equilibrium sea level for today's level of CO2 of 400 ppm is 23 meters or 75 feet higher than today's sea level. And the equilibrium temperature is about 17 degrees Celsius higher than today. So in the long run, we have to control CO2. What we do with BioRock, we can protect the ecosystems until governments act on reducing excess CO2 into the atmosphere. I begged Jamaica for 25 years to be leaders in that, in the Global Climate Change Convention, proposing real solutions to save it. So uh, in the long run, if we don't deal with the climate change issue, we will lose whatever we do in the short and medium run. But until then, until then, it is possible to restore the ecosystems. And in fact, by restoring the mangroves and the wetlands in the grill, we can store huge amounts of carbon removed from the atmosphere. Those are natural carbon sinks that we have been destroying and we, we need to grow back. So here in the grill, we believe that it's possible to grow back the beach, the reefs, the fisheries, the seagrass, the wetlands, restore the water quality, and restore the carbon balance in terms of global climate change quite easily here in Negril. Thank you.